Hey class, let's look at chapter two, Founding America. Um, we'll start off with, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered a landmass where people already had advanced civilizations, but in a European-centric mindset, discovered America. Um, fast forward to the 1600s. Um, some people from England, many of who were escaping religious persecution in England, came over to America to establish their own self-sufficient colonies. Um, in this case, uh, the people who were escaping religious persecution in England came over to establish some of their own religious persecution. So that was pretty cool. Um, and that's what we find with the Puritans and, uh, you know, like I said, Massachusetts, uh, Bay Colonies, those areas. Um, along the eastern seaboard of what is now the United States, um, different English colonies are set up with different goals in mind. Some are religious-based um, cities and towns uh, that are set up. Um, others are set up to... Um, you know, harvest the raw material that the New World has to send back to the geriatric world. Um, so there's both this social colonization of America and an economic colonization that goes on, okay, in America. Um, let's advance American society forward a bit, and per now we have, you know, the 13 original colonies. All right, we're getting into the 1700s now. Um, you got, you know, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania, etc. Um, there are, um, well, more or less people are happy being English in America. Uh, they consider themselves members of the English crown. They're super psyched about it. After all, England's a super world power at this point. Um, why wouldn't you want to be British? There are some people, though, in the colonies that are getting increasingly agitated. They want um, to set up their own independent nation. They're not so stoked on being English. Um, now, what we're... Just like we divided American politics, you know, today we can divide the colonies up um, in terms of people that supported revolution, people who did not support revolution. So you have these group of colonial elites. They were royalists, southern planters, and merchants. Those were the colonial elites, people that had power and money. And then there were the not elites, the commoner people. You got your laborers, your sharp shopkeepers, you know, your little tiny blacksmith people, um, and you got small farmers, so not your southern plantation owners, but your, you know, Joe Schmo on a acre making some crop for themselves type thing. Um, there's this tension growing between the colonial elites that have the power and like being part of England and the not elites who want to have a little something for themselves, okay? However, the American Revolution was not in any way inevitable. Um, we tend to think of, you know, this divide happening and then it just inevitably leading towards America getting its freedom from England. As I said, most people like the fact that they were British. So, um, there was no inevitability towards this. Um, there were some key economic and political events that happened between, say, the early 1700s and the, um, you know, 1770s when America engaged in its war against England. Um, and it was these events that led to the revolution.
we could have followed a path where we stayed friendly with England throughout our history, but things happened and that's not the way it went. So we started to see this turning point in the um, from you know a stable relationship with England and the colonies being hooray, we're English to an increasing desire for independence, starting with um, the end of the French and Indian War. It's known here as the French and Indian War. Um, the uh, in Europe, Seven Years' War. What happened in the in um, America at this time was the French and um, Indians got all allied up and fought against the English. The English were not being super nice to the indigenous people after all. Um, and while this war was going on, um, like I said, it also happened in the colonies. England had to expend a bunch of money protecting the colonists. Okay. Um, England had to send over troops to fight um, the French and Indian Alliance. The um, they had to build forts to you know help protect the colonies. At the end of this war, England had spent a lot of money protecting the colonies, and they said, "Hey, it'd be super awesome if the colonies." you know, paid a little bit back for their defense. Let's say that the colonies took personal responsibility for their own defense. Um, the colonies, especially the rich elites that would later become the founders, uh, did not necessarily like the idea of taking personal responsibility for their own defense. Um, because, imagine this, you haven't paid taxes for a long time, um, you know, you haven't been paying the money to upkeep the defense of your own area. Now, all of a sudden, you're being asked to pay additional taxes to, you know, defend your area. While we may intuitively think, hey, it seems obvious that people should pay for their own defense. When you go from being not taxed to being taxed, it feels kind of oppressive. Okay, so... Think of it, um, if you're driving, you know, down a road and you use this road for free all your life, you know, you pay gas taxes to maintain the road, but then all of a sudden the state comes in and puts a toll booth and says, now you have to pay money for this road you used to use for free all the time. Wouldn't that feel like, um sort of an extra oppressive burden that the state was putting on you. Uh, that's the way the uh, colonialists sort of reacted. So we have the Stamp Act and we have the Sugar Act. These are different taxes that uh, England imposed on the colonies to try and um, raise revenue. Um, the colonials reacted not favorably to these taxes. Um, there were, you know, protests, riots, boycotts. England eventually rescinded a lot of these taxes. Um, the sort of straw that broke the camel's back with regards to both the um, uh, English sort of putting up with the colonies um, avoiding personal responsibility for paying for their own defense and the colonies, the colonists being upset with English taxes. Um, and this is what shifted the balance of power in the colonies. So remember, we have this alliance of colonial elites that's keeping, that like being British, that's keeping the colonies in, you know, under England's control, the merchants, the royalists, and the southern planters. Um, this is what breaks up that alliance. That then allows the more radical elements, the small farmers, the plantation, or the um, shopkeepers, and then the sort of revolutionary idealists, you know, Patrick Henry, Sam Adams, and big people here, um, 
allowed those revolutionary idealists to sort of come in and push the colonies towards um, revolution. Um, England gave a monopoly on the tea trade to the East India Company. Up until this time, the merchant class in America had been making a good amount of money being middlemen uh, between, you know, the East India Company and the other traders in England. Um, you know, taking the tea, buying the tea from them, and then selling it to the people in the colonies. So there's a merchant class that was making lots of money off of that. What this monopoly did is it eliminated that middleman from the supply chain. So where before the East Indian Company would have to sell to um, people in America who would then sell the tea to, you know, your average Joe, now the East India Company could just legally was guaranteed protection just to be able to sell to the American colonists cutting out that middleman. Um, the merchant class who before enjoyed their Britishness and their protection under the British crown um, because they made lots of money off of it. Now we're not making money off of it. We're kind of upset. And so they started to engage in acts of protest and boycotts like um, the colonists had done under the Stamp Act and Sugar Act to attempt to get this monopoly reversed. Now there's this dude, Sam Adams, who's a colonial revolutionary. He's a radical. He wants the colonies to declare independence. He, you know, takes up with the merchant class in America and says, yeah, you know what? This is totally not fair. We should totally get England to rescind this tea um, monopoly. The merchant class, though, at this time, still wanted to be part of the British crown. They still considered themselves English, they were just trying to get this one thing changed. They didn't want to move towards a revolution. Sam Adams wanted there to be a revolution, wanted there to be political independence. What Sam Adams did was he got the merchant class to boycott in such a way against England that it would cause England to respond with very heavy, oppressive, draconian measures against the colonies. So, Sam Adams' goal was not to make England rescind the tea monopoly. Sam Adams' goal was to make England, was to provoke England to act extremely harshly towards the colonies. You may say, why would an American patriot, a colonial patriot, somebody who wants freedom, want England to act very harshly towards the colonies, would want England to engage in, you know, very draconian measures against the colonies. Sam Adams read the writing on the wall and said, thought to himself, you know what, there are lots of people in America that are ready for revolution. They just need a little, a little extra push to get there. This little, little extra push they need is for England to act super oppressive towards certain colonists, basically. So, think of it this way. Um, you're, you break the rule. You're, you're at your parents' house, and you're young, let's say. Um, you, you missed your bedtime. All right, everybody in this class, you're now five. Congratulations. You uh, stay up past your bedtime. Your mom and dad comes in, and they're like, why are you still up? I'm so mad at you. And then they give you a spanking. This is what happens in the mind of children and also in the mind of the colonists, what happened with England. My parents acted harshly towards me. They were unfair and they were mean and I'm mad as ever. I 
hate them, I hate them, I hate them. Um, that will sometimes get children to act out even more strongly against their parents, or we often find um, if children don't act out against their parents after being spanked, they act out against other children or other adults. So, um, because they're like, I'm being treated unfair, I'm being physically abused, um, when all I did was stay up past my bedtime, um, you know, my parents didn't listen to me, so they may go to school and hit another kid, um, they may disobey the teachers, um, if they obey the parents, it's something out of fear. Um, but the thing is, it doesn't, that sort of harsh punishment doesn't get children to be like, oh, thank you, parents, I love you so much. It gets them to be all, like, pissed off. Um, now, Sam Adams got the merchant class to dress up like Iroquois Indians and dump some tea off of some ships into the Boston Harbor. It's the Boston Tea Party. He did this wanting Britain to come in and spank America. Okay? Because he knew what would happen would America would not go, oh, I'm sorry, I see the error of my ways. They would go, screw this shit, I'm pissed off now. And then they would revolt. And that's exactly what happened. Britain finally sort of like snapped. It went, you know what? We had these taxes, and you revolted, and you boycotted. Now you're throwing this tea overboard, and this is it. We're going to, you know, close down harbors. We're going to eliminate trade. They even went after some of the uh, loyal royal, royalists who were in charge of different governments in the colonies, overthrew those governments, or, you know, revoked those governments' charter, and installed... Um, people from England to rule those colonies. So, um, let's say um, Virginia might have been, you know, had an elected local government. Now that elected local government was gone and there was a royal colonial governor in charge. Um, so, England comes in, pisses off the merchant class, then pisses off the um, some of the royalists that had uh, governmental positions, and that pushes all those people to join with the, you know, small-time laborers, shopkeepers, whatever, to go towards revolution. The effect of England's punishment was not to make America acquiesce, but to piss off the colonists and led them to revolution. So Sam Adams did some pretty expert maneuvering, realizing that this act of sort of um, civil disobedience of throwing the tea overboard would not get what the merchants wanted, which was to stay English, but to um, have the tea monopoly rescinded, but instead to have the tea monopoly stay in place and to get England to be extra mean towards the colonists, which would then make people go, ah, screw this, we're gone. Um, so in 1776, we have the Declaration of Independence, there's a war, and in the 1780s, America gets its freedom from England. I know I skipped over a lot of war stuff there, but it's not important. Moving on. America gets its freedom, we need a colonial government. Well, I guess actually no longer colonial government, we need a new government. We need something to, you know, uh, unite the colonies under us, you know, under one government. We just fought this war for independence, now let's, you know, govern ourselves. The first attempt at this was called the Articles of Confederation. This was the first government. All right, now I'm going to back up. The Declaration of Independence was signed in uh, July 4th, 1776. That was a list of reasons why the colonists were declaring independence from England. 
The Declaration of Independence is not a governing document of the United States. Make this point clear because it gets confused. The Declaration of Independence was not a governing document of the United States. The Articles of Confederation was our first governing document of the United States. Okay? The Articles of Confederation was a very decentralized, um, allowed for a very, or created a very decentralized government. Essentially, all of the states were, had, all the states had lots of power. So Georgia as a state had lots of power. North Carolina had lots of power. And there's a very weak central authority. All right. Um, the Article of Confederation allowed for a unicameral, a single national legislative body where each state had essentially one vote in that national body. Now, the national legislature could call for taxes, could try and raise taxes to, you know, help um, with an army to defend the colonies or defend the states now, um, would try and pass laws uh, governing all of the states. However, the problem with the Articles of Confederation was there was no national executive branch what we would now recognize as the president. There was no president. So while the legislative branch could pass laws, in this case, you know, the national government could pass laws, they didn't have any executive branch available to enforce the laws. So we're the national government, all right? And we all say we need to enact a 2% tax on all sales to raise money to buy some weapons so that if somebody attacks America, we can defend ourselves. The national legislature passes that law. Now, though, it's up to the states to enforce the law for us. So the American legislature, us, in this case, this analogy, we could not collect that money ourselves. We had to rely on Georgia or Massachusetts, or Maryland, or Pennsylvania to collect that money for us. What this meant, or what this led to, was that if there was a state that did not like the law that was passed, they would just ignore it. So let's say you have 13 states, 12 of the 13 states voted for this 2% tax. The one state that didn't vote for it, let's say, is North Carolina. North Carolina didn't vote for it. The North Carolina government will say, well, we didn't want this. We're not going to enforce it. We're not going to collect the money for you. The Articles of Confederation did not allow for the national government, um, did not give the national government a way to force, let's say, North Carolina, um, in this case, they did not have a way they could force North Carolina to enforce the national laws. Makes sense. There was, since there was not a strong central government, there was no way to create that national unity, to create a um, uh, to create a uniformity of laws and enforcement of laws across the country. Okay, there were a couple of so that was a major deficiency with the Articles of Confederation. That deficiency was sort of exploded in people's faces with a couple of big events or big problems. Um, one problem was that the Articles of Confederation, there was no central government that could protect anybody's rights that had a lot of power. And in all these state governments, there are actually some cases where, stay with me here, the state legislatures and the state governments were so democratic that the majority of the people actually had power in them. And that was a problem. Yeah, you heard me. One of the problems, according to the founders with the Articles of Confederation, was that it was too democratic. There was too much democracy going on. We had a one person, one vote system, and that was bad. 
bad democracy. I think Madison shook his hand with this too. Bad democracy. So, here's what would happen in states where things were too democratic. Um, who's more populous in the country, rich people or poor people? If you said poor people, you're right. Now, let's say there's these rich dudes and they own like 70% of the land. And you got like 50 rich dudes and they own 70% of the land and you got like a million poor dudes and, you know, most of them don't own any land. Those million poor dudes are going to get together and they're going to vote for um, people to represent them in office that will look out for their own best interests, that will look out for the poor dudes' best interests. Lots of cases, what this took the form of was the poor dudes voting for people to go to the state legislative body who would then enact laws that would take some of the land from the rich dudes and give it to the poor dudes. Okay, so you're a um, mostly landless um, commoner sort of scraping by, skinning your teeth. Um, you get the right to vote, you vote in somebody who's going to give you an acre of land so that you can grow crops and sustain yourself. That's super exciting for you, right? You're like, yes, I now can be self-sufficient. And that's what these people are going for. They're like, right now we don't have anything. We can't even, like, people can't take personal responsibility for themselves because they don't have even the means to be able to work so that they can take personal responsibility for themselves. You can't, you know, buy your own food if you don't have the ability to get money to buy your own food, right? So what they did was they had their legislative bodies enact what we might call today agrarian reform, um, where, as I said, land that was not being used by the rich people was then divided to poor people that were um, didn't have any land to use. So then they would have something that they could labor on, work on, and sort of, you know, be self-sufficient for themselves. Um, the wealthy colonial interests, well, I guess state interests at this point, the wealthy people in the states did not like this. They don't like the common folk taking money from them. So that's one big problem with the Articles of Confederation, that there are states where the majority have power, where the um, democratic impulses of the people are enacting laws that are not always favorable towards the wealthy interests. So, problem number one. Problem number two, Articles of Confederation prove uh, to be unable to defend the states. We see the main example of this in Daniel Shea's Rebellion in Massachusetts. All right, Shea's Rebellion, Massachusetts. A bunch of small, poor farmers in western Massachusetts are about to have their farms foreclosed upon because they're not able to pay their mortgages. What Shea's Rebellion does, what the goal of Daniel Shea's revolt, was to get a bunch of those poor, going into bankrupt farmers who were about to lose their farms, have them rise up, have them make it so the courts in Western Massachusetts could not come into session um, and because the courts could not come into session that means the judges could not rule and say your farms foreclosed upon so in order for like the bank to say yeah we're taking that property back you've got to have a judge say bank you can take that property away from them however if you have a rebellion and prevent the judges from getting to their judgeships booths, you know, getting to the courthouse, 
where they can then make the ruling saying the bank can take the home, then the bank can't take the home. So Daniel Shea's Rebellion, their goal was to prevent the judges from uh, being able to tell the banks that they were legally allowed to take all these people's farms. Uh, they largely succeeded. Um, but the thing that, at least in the temporary, the thing that really scared people was that it took way too long for the federal government to respond to that rebellion in Massachusetts and put it down. Okay, so his idea, let's say you're, you're hanging out in South Carolina and South Carolina, South Carolina decides they want to be independent from the United States again. Um, you kind of want um, Obama to be able to bring military force to bear in South Carolina and crush the rebellion quickly, right? You don't want to have to sweat through like a month of these rebels running ransack through South Carolina, um, making it look like they might, might actually succeed in like withdrawing South Carolina from the Union. You want to have a quick response so that you can hang out in South Carolina knowing that you get to be an American citizen for the foreseeable future. You don't have to say, oh man, now I'm South Carolinian. Um, what the Articles of Confederation shows is that the federal government can't respond well to these problems. It would be like South Carolina, a bunch of, you know, people in South Carolina getting together with all their guns and saying, we're toppling America, yeah, let's go! And then them taking over land and overthrowing local governments and establishing, you know, an area that they control for like a month. And the rest of America is going, dude, let's do something about this. Come on, Obama. Where are those, you know, troops that we have? Imagine, you know, MSNBC and Fox News and CNN, 24 hours. Obama is super inept at responding to the rebellion in South Carolina. You know, he's not doing anything. Is this a weak failure of our national government? Blah, blah, blah. Of course, if he responded quickly, Fox News would go, Obama's tyrant. Rawr. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. MSNBC would go, see, I told you about those white people Republicans. They're racist. Harken back to a previous video. Okay, so, imagine your central government could not protect you against crazy people in your state. You'd want there to be a stronger central government probably to protect you, right? I would assume you're saying yes, which is why the elites in the colonies got together and they say, hey, we need to reform these Articles of Confederation so that we have a stronger central government and we make sure that the poor people don't take our money and that if there is some attack of some kind, the government can respond to it and put it down faster than they did in Massachusetts. Um, so they organize to hang out in Philadelphia and while they go there with the intention to amend the Articles of Confederation. James Madison has an ace in his back pocket. He comes to the um, to Philadelphia with a proposal for a brand new government, the Constitution. Wow. Right? And because he comes prepared with the proposal, the Constitution, the debate in Philadelphia quickly goes from amending the Articles of Confederation to creating this brand new government, which we'll get, Constitution. And I'll talk about this in class, what the Constitution is, how we got it, the debates, things like that. Um, but that's the setup. 
Cool. Have a good day, whatever time it is you're watching this. Um, peace.